Good morning, and welcome to the City Club of Chicago's virtual program, COVID on Campus, How Higher Ed is Adapting. We're very pleased today to have three preeminent people in their fields in higher ed in Chicago. Dr. Gloria Gibson from Northeastern University, Dr. Wayne Giles from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Dr. Joan Holden from Loyola University. First, let me tell you a little bit about our guests today. Dr. Gloria Gibson, a native of East St. Louis, she came to Northeastern from Morgan State University in Baltimore, which is a historically black university and college, where she served as provost and senior vice president for the Division of Academic Affairs. She was also in various administrative roles at Indiana University of Bloomington, Arkansas State, and the University of Northern Iowa. Northeastern, as you may know, is a federally designated Hispanic serving institution and minority serving institution. And during her tenure as president, Dr. Gibson has focused on providing access and opportunity to all students to make sure they have support services in place to ensure their success. She's a first graduation, first generation college graduate herself, and she strives to inspire students in Chicago and beyond. She knows that a degree is obtainable and will change the trajectory of one's life. Now we have Dr. Wayne Giles. He is the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Prior to joining UIC, he was the Director of the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, which has been in the news quite a bit lately. He also led the Division of Population Health at the CDC, one of the agency's most diverse divisions with programmatic and research activities in community health promotion, arthritis, aging, healthcare utilization, and racial and ethnic disparities in health. In Africa, clinical trials evaluating the effectiveness of cholesterol-lowering agents and studies examining racial differences in the incidence of stroke. We're lucky to have Dr. Wayne Giles with us today. And finally, our third panelist is Dr. Joan Holden. Joan Holden has been with Leona University for more than 20 years and has served as the director of the Wellness Center for the past four. She's also the health officer for the management policy and command extended team for Loyola's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Joan is a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner and is responsible for managing the Wellness Center. Her duties as health officer involve providing guidance to executive leadership at the university on all health matters during the COVID pandemic. Thank you all for joining us today. We're gonna to begin our program with some opening remarks from each of our panelists today. Um, and let's begin with Dr. Gibson from Northeastern University. The floor is yours. There we go. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I just like to uh, thank the City Club of Chicago for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. I think it's important for me to start by giving some context about Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, we have three locations in the city of Chicago and a fourth in suburban uh, Grays Lake. Our main campus is located just off Foster Avenue on the northwest side of the city. And our other city locations are in Avondale and Bronzeville neighborhoods. As was stated earlier, we are federally designated as a Hispanic serving and minority serving institution. We are urban in our mission and our makeup. Many of our students are first generation college students. Many hold down one or more jobs to pay their tuition, and many live with their families. Like most universities and businesses, we quickly shifted to remote teaching and working in March. 
that shift came with some of the expected technological and logistical bumps in the road. But something else happened almost immediately. Many of our students suffered a financial hit as they lost their jobs or their family members lost their jobs. Suddenly, education became secondary to survival as they experienced housing and food insecurity. Northeastern put out a call to raise money for our student emergency fund, which provides small grants to pay for rent or medical expense, medical bills or other expenditures. I'm happy to say that since March, that fund has provided over $100,000 to more than 400 students. Even these seemingly small financial awards can make the difference between dropping out and persisting for some of our students. While COVID-19 disproportionately affected communities of color, we simultaneously saw civil unrest over the death of George Floyd. It felt like a second setback for our students for whom social justice is very, very meaningful. In response, Northeastern raised money for a new George Floyd social justice scholarship for students dedicated to pursuing leadership roles in the multifaceted intersectional work of social justice. We, we quickly exceeded our fundraising goal, and last month we awarded $5,000 scholarships to three African American students. We plan to make this an endowed scholarship for the future. Northeastern used Federal CARE Act funding to support more than 35 students with another new initiative, our Social Justice Leadership Housing Award, which provides free housing for students who positively impact their university, career, and communities. And using federal government emergency education relief, and that is called the GEAR funds, we re-enrolled 40 students through the program that waived up to $3,000 in outstanding tuition and fee debt for eligible students who left Northeastern and had not graduated from another institution. COVID-19 and social justice are interwoven equity issues in 2020. And I am proud how we have responded to both. Our amazing faculty and staff have worked hard to empower our students to break the barriers this year has thrown to them. The health and safety of our university community is paramount. This semester, more than 90% of our classes are either remote or online, and that will be the case as well in the spring. With our cautious approach, we have seen only about 10 positive cases on campus and no spread between individuals in our community. Meanwhile, we are continuing to adapt and adjust through strategic te technology investments, faculty training, and remote support for our students. In December, we will host our first virtual commencement ceremony as a new class of graduates join more than 83,000 alumni in the workforce. I'm so happy to represent Northeastern Illinois University at this City Club event, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Dr. Holden, let's hear from you now. On behalf of the students, faculty, staff at Loyola University Chicago, let me extend my thanks to the City of Chicago, Club of Chicago, for the invitation to participate in today's discussion on how higher education is adapting in the age of COVID-19. 
The perspectives I would like to share today are grounded in the experience of wearing two hats, both as the head of Loyola's Wellness Center, which provides a range of health services to our students, and as the health safety officer for Loyola's emergency response plan team, which was convened more than nine months ago as the severity of the pandemic became apparent. Navigating this pandemic has required resourcefulness, compassion, prudence, and perhaps all flexibility. We have had more than 250 individuals working on different topics related to preparation for academic and operational continuity as we conduct online coursework and, and continue to work remotely. In the early days of the pandemic, our university's leadership team led by Dr. Joanne Rooney and the emergency response management team created a governance structure and working groups to ensure informed, rapid, and collaborative decision-making. And we adopted a set of guiding principles from which to evaluate our decisions. Of course, the health, safety, and well-being of our entire university community is at the core of our decision-making principles, which are further informed by science, data, and best practices. In addition, as a Jesuit institution, our mission and values of being people for and with others is another important aspect of how our Rambler community conducts itself and holds itself accountable as we wear masks, socially distance, and practice other measures to keep each other safe and slow the transmission of COVID-19. With the health, safety, and well-being of our campus community being central to decision-making, we decided to go 90% online for the fall offerings for, for fall semester and to not host students in our residence halls this past fall. This was done intentionally to protect our students, faculty, and staff in order to mitigate risk of COVID across our community. We are proud and very grateful to our students, their families, faculty and staff and for their determination and flexibility as we work to keep our students on their academic tracks while balancing all of the public health concerns. So much of what we hear or read about in the news is disconcerning and I would like to interject some positive actions that we here at Loyola have taken to mitigate risk. One of the developments that I am most proud of it was the establishment of our Health Care Advisory Council which is comprised of Loyola's own doctors and researchers that meets on a weekly basis. We use this group of people so that we could benefit from their knowledge and expertise to help us inform decisions on the management policy and command team. We also developed our own symptom checker mobile phone application. This app, which we encourage everyone to use when they come to campus, is part of a social norming campaign. It assists our students, faculty, and staff to identify on a daily basis any possible symptoms they may be experiencing related to COVID and informs them on what steps they should ne next take. In the Wellness Center where I lead, we also provide telecounseling for students for mental health needs that we know are on the rise during this pandemic. This is a service that our students who live off campus in the state of Illinois can access. We also offer telemedicine for our students who feel more comfortable accessing their medical care in the, in the convenience of their own home. When we thought we would have students in the halls this past fall, we created new roles called COVID care coordinators that would assist people with COVID in the residence halls. But when we made the decision to not have the students in the residence hall this fall, we pivoted those employees to become contact tracers and they have continued to serve our Loyola community. We also changed the way we see students here at the university this fall. We have a satellite clinic that we developed that is offered for students who are having COVID-like symptoms that is separate from the main wellness center to help mitigate risk. Our testing strategy here at the university has been what we call targeted testing, which has been implemented with the help from our Parkinson School of Public Health Epidemiologists. High risk groups have been identified and in late summer, we started testing them regularly, and that continues to, to this day. Navigating this pandemic has required compassion, prudence, resourcefulness, and above all, and perhaps the most important, flexibility. We've had more than 250 people working on different topics in relation to preparation for academic and operational continuity as we continue to, to conduct our online and work remotely. While we plan to welcome students in a limited capacity back to the campus this spring, we are guided by science, data, and best practices. And we know that resilience does not necessarily mean going back to what we did in the past. For example, this fall, this spring, we will be offering uh, a 
not only having st students coming back in the residence hall, but we will also offer a much more robust testing program. We have entered into a partnership with SHIELD Illinois as a community partner, and we will be doing broad-based, saliva-based testing for students, faculty, and staff this fall, this spring. Resilience is the ability to adapt, innovate, and make necessary changes and to evolve and deepen our lives and work to meet the challenges of an ever-changing world. This is the kind of adaptability our Loyola students, faculty, and staff have shown these past months. And it's this forward-looking quality that has driven the Jesuit mission of the education for nearly 500 years. We are learning and sharing science and data faster than ever. And I am confident that we will emerge from this period stronger, resilient, and more adaptable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holden. And now let's hear from Dr. Giles. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the City Club for inviting uh, me to participate as well. Um, I want to start uh, as well with a little bit of context about UIC. Um, the University of Illinois at Chicago is the largest university um, in the city. Um, we frequently consider ourselves a university for Chicago. It's part of the, we are a minority serving institution and a Hispanic serving institution as well, with over 30,000 students, uh, many of whom come from Chicago public schools, uh, many of whom are first generation as well. I think what makes UIC unique is the diversity of our students, but also the fact that we're a Research One university. And for many of us, including myself, who came to UIC about three years ago, it is that combination of very diverse student body, along with high-powered research, that really draws us, along with the uh, commitment to social justice and health equity. Um, like all three universities, we moved in uh, March uh, very quickly to online. Um, we realized very quickly that right, this wasn't just the pandemic that was impacting us, but it was the financial impact um, and it was the issues of racial injustice as well. And all three of those factors had impact on our students, but also our faculty and staff as well. And so because of that, we really had to pivot and think not just about the digital divide, which was very real for uh, many of our students and providing laptops and other things, which we moved really quickly to do, but also the financial resources. And while the CARES Act was really impactful and helpful for us, um, we did have a number of students undocumented and international students where the CARES Act wasn't helpful. Um, and here uh, we did find a number of donors who were particularly helpful um, in providing resources for us. Uh, as Dr. Holden mentioned, mental health issues for our students are huge, um, and we've been uh, in having them interact with the counseling center, but also um, all faculty and staff have been reaching out to them. We provide group events for well-being um, as well. Um, and then our international students have particularly been impacted, not just because of COVID, but also because of the current um, administration and all the uncertainty that that's had. And so we've had a number of forms specifically for targeting our international students as well. I should also mention that the impact that COVID has had has not just been on our students, but also the impact and well-being of our faculty and our staff as well. And so frequently reaching out to them, connecting them to services has been really important. I want to pivot quickly and talk a little bit about some of the unintended consequences of COVID and our moving to online. Um, and one of the things I, I wanted to highlight is, is what happened early on when we moved to online. And every April we have a preview day um, and frequently we'll have 50 to 60 students participated in, in that. Because it was online, um, because of COVID, we had to move to an online environment. And lo and behold, we did it on April 3rd. We had twice the number of students participating in our preview day. And they were engaged the entire day. This fall, we've been having a number of open houses, also virtual as well. And again, we're seeing really robust attendance in this. Um, we've also noted that some of our classes, particularly our 8 a.m. classes, um, have increased attendance because it's easier for students to roll out of bed and sort of go right on to the class. So I, I bring this up just because I think there are some um, interesting uh, uh, unintended uh, 
uh, consequences that we might think, but we, we also are doing research mixers across the campus. Frequently, we would have 50, 60 faculty participating to them because of the online environment, we're seeing twice the, the attendance. So I think it's just something for us to think about sort of as we move forward and beyond the, the pandemic, what are the things that, that we might keep moving forward? I also wanted to quickly highlight some of the leadership that we at UIC have been able to provide to the city of Chicago and, and to our community. Um, so you probably have heard in the media about the um, Moderna vaccine that was led by Rick Novak and colleagues in the College of Medicine. We're also involved in clinical trials around remdesivir as well. Our Mile Square uh, Federally Qualified Health Clinic has really done amazing work ramping up testing, particularly on the north and south sides of Chicago, which has really been, as you all know, been devastated um, by the, the pandemic and them ramping up. I was, I was last week on our call with the city um, where they mentioned that as the city has ramped up testing its federally qualified health centers like Mile Square that have been key um, to this. Um, because we are the only public school of public health um, in the state, we have an intergovernmental agreement with the uh, uh, Illinois uh, Department of Public Health, and through that our faculty have been a real resource for the Illinois Department of Public Health. We've also noted early on in the pandemic we were getting lots of email requests um, from businesses, local health departments and city and citizens that so we created an incident command to respond or incident command center to respond um, to those requests. We're partnering with Malcolm X, Sinai, uh, Chicago Cook uh, Workforce Partnership and NORC um, to do community-based contact tracing and have hired over 500 contact tracers that are doing work around the city. Um, our students, both undergraduate and graduate, are also participating in contact tracing efforts specifically focused for the UIC campus and are doing amazing work there. And the last thing that I will highlight very quickly is the work that we're doing with Mayor Lightfoot's Racial Equity Rapid Response Task Force and where we're working with community groups, particularly on the west and south side, to target street outreach. So that just gives you sort of a high level uh, perspective of some of the things that are going on across the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giles. All right, we're going to segue into some questions now, uh, both some we received in advance online through our platform and also some that are coming in during the program. Um, first of all, let, let's just kick off with something I, I'm sure is on many people's minds, especially reminded by the photo behind you, Dr. Holden, of Sister Jean. The question comes from Anna Rosenick and others. How is Sister Jean doing? Sister Jean is rocking it. She is doing just fine. She is living at the Claire. Uh, she's actively engaged with um, many of us here at the university. She's safe. She just celebrated her 101st her birthday in August, and she is just doing fine. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that update. Uh, let's get let's get back to the topic of the of the day. Uh, Dr. Giles, could you share a little bit more? You mentioned uh, just at the end of your remarks, um, partnering um, with the city, I believe, on uh, racial equity street outreach. Can you just uh, flesh that out a little bit and tell us more about that? Yeah, so, um, and it's really an exciting project. Um, so uh, the mayor has created a racial equity rapid response committee, and this was because of the disproportionate impact that COVID had on the uh, west and south sides of Chicago. And, and, you know, first we saw an uptick in cases and deaths in particular in African Americans and now also in the Latinx community, and it was uh, to respond to that. So community-based organizations uh, the UIC School of Public Health, UI Health, um, healthcare providers are all part of that along with the mayor's office and CDPH. More recently, uh, because of what we're seeing in the cases, the mayor last week announced Protect Chicago, which in addition to the broad citywide messaging about people staying home, that's part of it, there's also going to be a street outreach uh, component for that as well. And so, um, 
handing out information about how people can stay safe, <clears throat> including door hangers that are going to blanket uh, the city. Um, in addition to that, um, we're going to have street outreach workers and some of our students as well participating, um, going throughout the community, encouraging people to stay safe. So uh, this is really, I think, an exciting opportunity for us all to come together and stay safe and make sure people are getting the message around, you know, wearing of masks, uh, uh, um, um, not congregating in, in groups, and also the important um, messages around testing as well. And so there will be ramping up testing that the city has also already, um, particularly on the south and west sides. Thank you for that. Um, this next question comes from Kenneth Jandis, who is with the American College of Education. And uh, Dr. Gibson, let's hear from you first. Uh, what obstacles, if any, have you encountered during the pandemic with respect to in-person in and online learning? And how do you see your enrollments fluctuating up or down um, in this new environment? Thank you for that question. Uh, I'll take the second question first. Um, we actually had planned for a 10% uh, decline in our fall enrollments. And um, we were very fortunate that uh, our fall enrollments, uh, we only saw a 4% decline in overall uh, enrollment. Uh, we saw an increase, a double digit increase, in fact, in our graduate enrollments um, at Northeastern. Um, our transfer enrollments uh, were about the same as the previous year, which is actually a good thing. Um, we, um, our retention rates uh, increased, uh, which again is, is excellent. Um, we also addressed the uh, gap that is sometimes present between majority and minority students. So our uh, Latinx students and our African-American students, um, that those retention rates uh, improved. Uh, where we saw the greatest decline um, was uh, in the area of our first time full-time freshmen. Um, so we did see a, a decline there, as many universities did. Um, many students uh, decided to either take a gap year or to work. Um, and, and so uh, that's where we saw a decline. But overall, um, we did uh, very well. Um, in regards to how students, uh, you know, sort of adapted to all of this, um, again, our students, our faculty and staff, I. I, I must uh, again uh, congratulate them on, on how well they did. Um, during our spring uh, semester, uh, at the end, we did a survey just to find out, you know, what, what are the areas where students may be um, struggling? And um, for some, they did need laptops, uh, and we were able to provide those, um, as, as Dr. Giles uh, has said uh, uh, about this uh, campus, uh, through, you know, either the GEARS funding or um, the CARES Act. Um, some of our students needed uh, broadband. Uh, their internet connectivity was not as good um, at home as it, it uh, is, of course, on campus. Um, and so providing um, hotspots for students uh, became very important. Um, but during the um, spring semester, our students uh, had a concern because they were at home with um, their sisters, their brothers, siblings, parents, and all trying to um, function. And sometimes it was not as conducive to um, study. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm glad that the students 
voice that concern to us. Um, again, uh, during the summer months, uh, we provided uh, study space for students in our student union. Uh, we provided, um, if students needed books, they, there was a grab and go uh, that we also uh, provided for students. Um, and so to, to uh, understand uh, what those challenges, besides, as I said earlier, the, the financial challenges, but to understand, um, to support our students through um, uh, online services for tutoring um, and to make sure that they have contact with their professors. Um, that was also uh, uh, very, very important. And the last thing I'll say is that we do have a COVID-19 task force uh, and uh, a transition a committee that our provost um, uh, put together to really uh, look at uh, issues as they uh, come up. We have um, a COVID forum, uh, which is a, um, a university-wide activity. Uh, we just had a, a forum yesterday uh, where we have panelists and we have an opportunity just like we're doing today for our students, faculty and staff uh, to ask questions. So I think during this period, it is important uh, to be as transparent as uh, to be transparent. It's also uh, important to find various mechanisms to communicate with um, our diverse constituent groups. Thank you. Um, Dr. Holden, can you speak to this? And I'll just repeat the two-parter here. What obstacles, if any, did you encounter as Loyola moved to an online learning environment? And have you seen uh, fluctuations up or down, you know, at a significant level in terms of enrollment? I do know that I don't have the enrollment numbers handy, but I do know that enrollment did drop somewhat when we first switched to an online format. Um, it's been challenging, just as Dr. Gibson has described. Um, we faced a lot of this very similar challenges that she just so uh, eloquently described. Um, we've also, from a health perspective, been challenged by um, telemedicine. Uh, at this time, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we can only offer telemedicine in the state of Illinois, particularly for tele, um, tele mental health services. So our students that are living outside the state of Illinois are unable, we are unable, unable to help them through counseling, which has been challenging for us. Um, we've also been challenged with other things such as supply chains, uh, management or testing. That has been a challenge for us as well. Um, also our students have complained, or we know that our students have trouble with sometimes staying engaged with online learning. And so we've made a lot of efforts from the Wellness Center in particular to do a lot of outreach for our students uh, that are home and trying to stay engaged with their peers. So much of learning is about being around other people and being home alone like this or with your family can be very challenging for a learning environment. So those are just, just some of the things that we've encountered here. Certainly not the, the only things, but those are just some of the things we've encountered. Thank you. Dr. Giles, obstacles that you've encountered in the online situation, and then again, the enrollment fluctuation. So um, um, first, uh, let me say, I, I agree with everything that I think that Dr. both Dr. Gibson and Dr. Uh, Holden uh, mentioned. We were experiencing many of the same things. I think the other thing for us, um, particularly in the School of Public Health, is a number of our faculty had never taught online. Um, and so for some of them, pivoting to an online environment was, um, and doing it over, you know, basically, you know, two to three weeks um, was a real challenge. Um, but our faculty were, you know, just one, understanding the technology, but, in all, but also sort of teaching online is very different than, than teaching in person. Um, but, you know, we put it, we had a number of webinars, um, to help to assist faculty. We provided a number of supports. We created a mentor mentee um, where, where some of our faculty who had more experience mentored other faculty. Um, and all of those strategies really helped uh, for them to pivot. Um, so I, I did want to lift that up because, and, um, and I will mention that I think that 
several of our faculty, now that they've gone online, realize that some of the courses that they thought never could be taught online, in fact, can be taught. So it was a really nice, I think, make, make experience for them. I think the student supports, I, I think, um, where we're currently doing a lot of investment is sort of out of the classroom support and touches with our students as part of that. Um, in terms of enrollment, um, our enrollment this year is actually level um, compared to, to last year. Um, our freshman class, um, as Dr. Gibson mentioned, was is also smaller, but because we're doing a better job in terms of retention of students and we're seeing an uptick in our transfer students, that led to uh, UIC-wide enrollment being stable. Um, within the School of Public Health, I think because now everyone understands public health and um, people are really interested, we're actually seeing a pretty robust um, increase in enrollment. Our undergraduate public health program, which has both a BS um, and a BS, saw a 50% increase um, in enrollment, uh, and our graduate program saw a 7% increase uh, in enrollment as well. We're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, lots of interest in public health through our open houses as well. All right. This question comes from Luis Narvaez from Chicago Public Schools. I would uh, ask this of all of you, perhaps we could start with uh, Dr. Holden. What percentage roughly of your student population, if, you're, if you know, opted to skip this term uh, because of the situation, either because of the pandemic or, and or the online learning um, as opposed to in-person? And then the second part of the question is, um, well, let's hold that part. It has to do with tuition. I'll hold that as a second question. So if you could address Dr. Holden, if you know offhand, um, you know, that the group of students who perhaps decided to just take a pass on this term. I do know that we did have students that took a pass, uh, decided to stay home for the for this fall semester. I don't actually have the exact number in front of me. I can certainly get that, find that information for you later probably, but I don't have the exact number or percentage, but I do know that there were some students that opted to not come back this, this past fall. They opted to stay online. But we do have a number of students. And most of our students um, do not live under normal circumstances in the residence hall. So we have a very large population of our student body that are living in the, low, in the Rogers Park campus area. Uh, so we, we are, you know, we, we always want to make it clear to everybody, we never closed. You know, we were always open for business and had our full enrollment for the fall, a little bit down, as I mentioned before, than what it normally is. But we, m many of our students got off campus housing when we no longer had the people in the residence hall. So they were still able to, you know, be, be part of the campus community in that way. Okay, um, Dr. Gibson, could you talk about the number of students or percentage that have opted to skip this term due to online learning? Yes. Or the pandemic in general? Yes, uh, and, and I would. My response would be very similar to Dr. Holden's. That I I don't know the exact percentage of students that decided not to uh, enroll this fall. Um, I would say that uh, again, uh, based on uh, our first time full time freshmen, that many of those students uh, decided to take a, a, a gap year, if you will, and, and not enroll. Uh, but again, when you look at our other areas, um, they, we, they, they were either flat or in fact, even increases in enrollment. But I, I think perhaps that some of our first time full time freshmen decided to take that um, year, take this year off, uh, or take this fall semester off to work, to save money, um, and to uh, make sure that when they do return, um, they're on a, you know, maybe a stronger financial footing uh, than they would have been had they come uh, during this year. Dr. Giles? Yeah, I mean, I think NYC is very similar with my colleagues. Um, um, we did see a, a, um, 
a, a decrease in our uh, first year freshman enrollment this year. I think because a lot of our a lot of students decided. Um, I think both because of COVID and concern with COVID concern about being online in their freshman year, but also because of economic. Uh, situations as well. And, and so, um, as uh, Dr. Gibson mentioned, many of them decided to work um, this year um, as part of that. Uh, so, th and that's sort of the trend that, that we saw this year. All right, now let's get to the tuition part. Um, Dr. Uh, Gibson, if you would, if you would answer this, and uh, this is a very interesting question. I think we've all wondered about this in terms of maintaining the same tuition rate when there's no on-site instruction. Um, how, how does that how does that play? Yes. Um, so, as many campuses, we've discussed um, that issue. Um, our uh, we do not uh, lower our tuition rate because. Uh, classes were um, online. Um, it is a um, still a level of uh, instruction uh, by our faculty, um, at, and uh, you know uh, many of our faculty were engaged in professional development during the summer, um, so that they could uh, when they started back in the fall, they were absolutely prepared uh, to teach online. So. Um, Academic excellence is at the core of what we do. Um, that has not changed. That will not change. Uh, and so uh, we have not lowered or adjusted our tuition uh, because students are taking online classes. Um, what we did do uh, was to eliminate some of the fees. And uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we feel that that has helped um, uh, many students uh, in a lot of ways. Um, for us, students are not coming to campus, so they're not paying a parking fee, right? Uh, and there are many other fees that uh, we are not uh, charging uh, for uh, this semester. So it um, it's kind of a you know, the tuition, we feel very strongly that we should uh, maintain uh, the tuition costs because students are still receiving a quality education. But for fees, we have adjusted some of those uh, because we feel that students are not um, getting some of those services. And so we don't need to, per to charge them uh, for some of those fees. Dr. Holden? Sorry about that. Uh, I would echo Dr. Gibson's remarks about um, being um, uh, offering online instruction. We consider our online uh, format to be high quality and in keeping with our in-class uh, quality for education. So we have not lowered our tuition either. We have also dropped fees. As Dr. Gibson mentioned, we have dropped, for example, our student development well, uh, wellness fee. People who are well, do not get charged to asked to have to pay to come to the wellness center if you're not on campus. So we've done things like that to try to help students um, get through this crisis, but we firmly believe that our online instruction is very is high quality. Um, our, our professors have worked um, extremely hard in providing high quality instruction, and they have shown an amazing ability to pivot from an on, on, in-class in to on, online learning. And so um, we have remain steadfast to that ideal. Dr. Giles? And we're, we're in the exact same situation. I think um, um, our faculty did a huge amount of work over the summer around pre professional development. Um, and so we actually, when I look at the quality of the teaching that ha happened last spring compared to what's happening this fall, the quality is much Im improved. Um, and, uh, and and the student interaction and engagement is much higher uh, this fall. Um, so we did not decrease tuition. Um, however, I will say last to spring, uh, when the rec center was closed, uh, those fees were reduced, some of the housing fees. So we also reduced fees as well as part of it. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Giles, I'd like to direct this question at you, given your um, role as the Dean of the School of Public Health and your experience in the field. Just where is this going? You know, what do you see as a professional um, and a healthcare educator? What's going to happen? <laughs> So, I mean, I, I think the last week we got some really good news, right? And, and we, we know that there are two vaccines in the pipeline, um, and they are both 90 and 95 percent effective. Um, and so I think that gives us some hope that the National Academy of Medicine, um, Science and Engineering um, um, came out uh, about uh, three weeks ago with a, 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 a playbook for sort of how to release the, the vaccine that, that I think is really important. They talk about four phases as part of this. Um, it's going to be vitally important um, that as we move forward um, that, um, that people take the vaccine. Um, I like to say it's not vaccines themselves that save lives, but the act of vaccination um, that saves lives, getting people um, to uh, to be willing to take the vaccine is going to be vitally important. Um, looking at timelines, it may be as early as April um, that um, that uh, vaccine is widely available. I think that's great news. It tells us all that there may be an end in sight to all of this. Um, but it also, to me, reinforces the importance of the messaging around people need to wear masks. People need to be physically distanced. People need to avoid uh, crowds. And the other thing that I think is really important, particularly as we're seeing the uptick, uh, uh, uptick in the fall, is people need to get their flu shot. We don't want people to get, have both the flu and COVID at the same time. So I like to say there are a lot of things that people can do to keep themselves and others safe. And we really need to be vigilant on that, particularly as we move to Thanksgiving um, and, and the winter holidays, Christmas, et cetera. We really need to be vigilant and, and really be uh, cognizant about large crowds. Uh, just to follow up on that um, to Dr. Giles and, and uh, the others as well, uh, higher education has long been a bastion for believing in science and academic freedom and all of those values that we hold very close as a democracy and a society and in a very politically charged environment um, with many untruths being told, um, how could we emerge from this uh, and what role does higher ed play in bringing us back to believing in science and listening to one another? I can start off and then others can chime in. You know, I can't say enough the importance of leadership and strong communication and the, and the importance of that as we move forward. Um, and I think uh, at UI Health and at UIC, I, I think we've done an amazing job. Um, I think in the city of Chicago, we also have great leadership um, as well. Um, so I think that's important. Um, and so, um, listening to those messages and folks across the city adhering to them, I think is important. Um, we need funding for our research that needs to be cutting edge. It needs to be community engaged research as well. That for us um, is a key part of, of all of this as well. Um, but I can't say enough about sort of the importance of sort of uh, um, higher ed leading and also setting the example. Um, as we move forward um, with the pandemic. Um, and I, I will also mention on the School of Public Health in UIC, there are a number of statements that we have come out with um, really around issues around racial justice, COVID, um, the importance of international students as well. And I think having that leadership is really important. Dr. Gibson? Yes, I would I would echo many of the things that Dr. Giles uh, just said. Uh, it it is important to keep the channels of communication open, um, and higher education plays a critical 
role uh, to not only educate our students uh, to the importance of uh, science and to the importance of um, information literacy, but also uh, our students are part, uh, they are part of other networks. Uh, they are a part and they're integral to their um, individual communities. Um, and so those, um, those channels, if you will, of communication uh, become very important. Um, and, and so as we look at uh, our curriculum, uh, curricula that we are offering to our students, as we um, look at um, the many uh, virtual, if you will, workshops uh, and webinars uh, that are still taking place on campus, uh, you know, our goal is to provide uh, the leadership and the information so that our students are informed uh, about issues and can communicate and talk about those issues, whether it's in a classroom, outside of the classroom, um, in a very informed, methodical, and strategic way. What are your thoughts, Dr. Holden? From the very beginning, we have used science to guide all of our decision making at the university. And I echo Dr. Gibson and Giles' remarks about institutions of higher education being the leaders in this. But when I think back and when we first started this pandemic, way back in January, when we repatriated our students from living abroad, it was the guidance from the World Health Organization that we followed. And when we brought students, and then when they came back, we have strictly adhered to the CDC and the Chicago Department of Public Health. Science has made, has guided every decision that we have made. We have put politics aside and we have made all of our decisions on the health and well-being of our, of our students based on public health principles. So again, institutions of higher education take the lead here. Thank you. All right, we've got a few more questions. Uh, this is from Martha Jantho, City Club Board of Governors member. Uh, how are classes requiring labs, hands-on labs, being managed in the online environment? Anybody? I can talk a little bit about that. I know we have reduced density in our labs. We also have strict social distancing in our laboratories. We have six feet apart. We also don't share equipment, and when we do use, when the students do use equipment, it's wiped down afterwards. Um, we've been very careful about the way our students are set up in our classrooms and our laboratories, um, and so we follow this, the guidelines from the CDC about social distancing in our laboratories. And I would say we, we're doing the. Go ahead. So uh, we're doing very much the same thing um, at, at UIC. The, the other thing that we are also doing is um, what I would call a hybrid lab where someone might demonstrate an experiment and then share the data with students. Um, and then they do the analysis and that sort of thing. So that's sort of another sort of thing. And, and in some of our labs because of um, the, the need for social distancing and decreased density, we might have one part, one half of the students do the lab live and the other half sort of do it sort of in that virtual hybrid approach. And then the second week they do the reverse. So that's sort of, that's sort of the way. I, I will also mention that on our campus, in our classes where we have been following social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera, we have not seen any cases of COVID transmission within the classroom. So that illustrates for us that yes, we can do a lot of this safely. Um, and that's, I think, an important lesson as we move forward. And I'll just briefly add um, what at Northeastern, we're doing something very similar. Uh, even though the majority of our classes uh, are remote online, uh, we, we are, um, we do have some face-to-face -face, uh, classes. Uh, some of those are performance classes, and some of those are 
our labs. Uh, and so again, we follow all of the uh, protocols uh, for having um, our students in uh, labs. Um, and uh, we have a hybrid, um, a very, very similar to uh, what uh, Dr. Giles has uh, just mentioned. Um, but we are, we're doing, we are uh, going to, after our uh, Thanksgiving break, um, students will not return uh, for face-to-face -face, uh, classes, even those that are uh, in the labs and those are, that are in the performance classes, um, because we just feel that it's safer that everyone finish off the semester um, with uh, remote learning. And the same is true at Loyola. We will be all remote after Thanksgiving. Yeah, UIC as well. Uh -huh. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, this one comes from Jose Torres. Will you require students and staff, including faculty, to take the vaccine once it's widely available as a precondition for returning to face-to-face -to -face learning? That's an excellent question. <laughs> That's a good, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I think I would look to IDPH and the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Chicago Department of Public Health for this, partly because they provide guidelines uh, for higher ed in terms of vaccinations at the state level. I will say that if you look at something like the flu vaccine, it's required for healthcare uh, workers. Um, and so I, I could see a scenario where our students in the health sciences where they're having direct interaction um, with, um, with, um, with patients, those students might be required to get it. And I, I could see a scenario where nurses and, and physicians and others in the healthcare scenario might be required to do it. Um, we'll sort of see. Um, I do think strong encouragement can go a long way. I mean, if you look at flu vaccinations, um, strongly encouraging people to do it really does go a long way. And I think we have had success in the past with flu. So I'm not sure everything uh, needs, needs necessarily a mandate. Although I, I will say having a policy helps things go a lot further. Yeah, I, I would just add that I I would take guidance uh, certainly from the state of Illinois and uh, uh, certainly from the Illinois Board of Higher Education (IBHE). I am sure that they will, um, you know, have uh, recommendations. They will issue guidance uh, for us when we get to that point. Uh, again, I think it's also an excellent question, uh, and uh, I'm 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 very hopeful that uh, we will have that vaccine uh, and uh, that we will be faced with how we're going to uh, develop policies uh, moving forward. But uh, we certainly will seek guidance from the state of Illinois public health. And on and Loyola also is also going to start to, um, again, I, I, I agree with everything that's already been said, um, the state of Illinois currently does require certain vaccines for all students that attend institutions of higher education. I suspect they will make the COVID-19 uh, vaccine also a requirement. We, we shall see. But Loyola is also starting to look at whether or not we should require flu vaccination across all of our campuses be a requirement. We don't do it right now. We only ask it of our health sciences campus, but it is something that we are going to explore in further detail as we go farther along. All right, we have uh, one more question. Uh, time for one more question, that is. There are others, certainly. Uh, this comes from Ivy Anderson. What impact do you think this will have on potential future careers? Thinking about public health, data analytics, informatics, research, epidemiology, the list goes on. Uh, anyone want to start? That may be the silver lining here. Uh, that we may find a lot of people start have a great interest in public health and informatics, uh, something that we need desperately in our society. So I would say I would anticipate that there would be an increased interest in students uh, learning about these different uh, positions or professions rather. I would echo that. Um, and 
uh, uh, certainly when I look at um, our Masters of Public Health uh, degree, uh, the, in, even before COVID, uh, those enrollments uh, were growing. Um, and, and so I would uh, think that uh, those enrollments will continue to grow along with uh, um, other areas uh, um, that deal with, uh, with health professions. Well, let's focus on so, that silver yeah, so, lining. Go ahead, Dr. Giles. Yeah, so um, I, I agree with my, my colleagues totally. I also think COVID has, you know, ripped open um, the disparities that we see and, and really the need for so issues around social justice and then sort of how do we bring back um, society better in a better way. And, and so for me, part of that also means thinking, you know, I, I agree totally on public health and all that, but I also think thinking about sort of how do we design society? So careers in urban planning, how do we invest in communities? And, and so thinking about business as well, you know, how do we, you know, and so I think there could be a lot of opportunities for students in higher ed, sort of across the university. Clearly, I'm hopeful that public health will lead that. We need that vitally. The public health infrastructure has been decimated by the last couple of in, um, administrations, and so we need additional resources. We need strong leadership. But I also think there could be opportunities in other disciplines across higher ed as well. And it's good to end on a silver lining. So, so thank you all very much, Dr. Gloria Gibson from Northeastern Illinois University, Dr. Joan Holden from Loyola University, and Dr. Wayne Giles from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Now, before we sign off, we have the ceremonial gifts. Uh, each of you will receive the much-coveted City Club mug, as well as a complimentary one-year membership in the City Club of Chicago. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wow. Thank you. You, did, you didn't know that was coming, did you? No. Um, Thank you. I also want to uh, just uh, end uh, again, uh, City Club of Chicago is a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving the public and presenting programs like this one on a variety of public policy issues that matter greatly uh, to our communities and our city and our state. So please, if you're of a mind, go to our website and uh, make a donation. Every dollar counts. We really appreciate your support. And I'm going to sign off now. This is Anne Marie St. Germain, member of the Board of Governors. Wear your mask and stay safe. Bye-bye.